Now, I have the pleasure of welcoming Indy Johar. Indy Johar is a director, designer, and architect based in London, co-founder of the studio Project Zero Zero, and involved in the last decade in the global network of Impact Hub. I'm sure many of you know Impact Hub, an international network of locally founded and operated co-working spaces focused on building entrepreneurial communities for impact. In 2016, he co-founded Dark Matter Laboratories to develop new support frameworks for collaborative system change. Dark Matter is a field laboratory focused on radically redesigning the bureaucratic and institutional infrastructures of our cities for a more democratic, distributed and sustainable future. Indy is building what he calls the boring revolution. Indy, the floor is yours. Hello, uh, I'm delighted to be here. I think uh, I'm delighted to be in this part of this conversation. So firstly, thank you to everyone for inviting me. I suppose I want to take this opportunity to really talk about this in a very particular way. I think the nature of the impact economy and what the future looks like, like for the impact economy is going to be transformed over the next 10 years. And it will look radically different from the impact economy we talked about over the last 15 to 20 years. We need to take account of the scale of the impact of COVID has triggered, whether it's the large scale numbers of people that have died, people that are going to be actually long-term impaired, the economic impact that will ensue off the back of that, which is going to be, I mean, Britain is facing the largest recession for 300 years, all the way to rising levels of inequality and real, real poverty increasing around the world. And in a way, we need to also recognize COVID itself is, is just a precursor. It's a sort of a herald of a new age of risks. It has exposed the fragility of our existing system. It is accelerating systemic injustices um, everywhere around the world. And it's reconfiguring these relationships. And it's driving a suite of cascading risks. These cascading risks manifest in how we live, where we live, the nature of our cities, which I think will be fundamentally transformed, and how we physically work, live, consume, operate in this world. And, but it's part of a much bigger story, whether it's nutrition decline that we're seeing globally, or whether we're seeing labor market automation and the implications it has for the return on labor versus the return on capital, all the way through to voter disenfranchisement, debt crisis, eco, uh, ecocide and species extinction and also the microenvironmental violence as we're seeing. So we need to recognize that COVID is perhaps a symptom of a much, much more structural problem, as is climate change. Climate change is a symptom of a much deeper structural problem. And the problem is generated with a different architecture, a different model and manifestation. The, these crises have a systems reality. The cause and effects are dis delayed and displaced. They're not linear. Climate change has been building for many, many years. It is now starting to cascade into significant impacts. And it has cascading impacts. So one crisis leads to another. They're not isolatable or single, single actor orientated. Nor is there some one single villain. Actually, we're all involved, implicated either directly, indirectly, or through nature of demand and social permission. And these entanglements, the nature of these crises, they're fully entangled. So whether you look at the affordability of housing crisis, it becomes clear when you look at this, it is not a crisis of just making more homes. It's a crisis of how we fund and finance our retail, our, our retail banking infrastructure. The nature of wealth creation in the 21st century in Western societies is linked to this crisis of affordability. It is not a question of just homes. So when you have a systems issue like this, how do we innovate? And the impact economy has not been designed to innovate the systems. The impact economy has been designed up till now to focus on single point interventions, magic bullets, ventures, uh, is venture systems to be able to solve this. The reality is that's not, that's not commensurate with the scale of the problem we're facing. And this manifests everywhere, whether you talk about the obesity system. Again, when you look at this, it becomes increasingly clear that there is no single magic bullet. There are many, many actors, 50, 60, 70 different actors, which affect the implications of obesity. There is no magic bullet. And this requires a whole portfolio of answers. A whole portfolio of answers, a suite of solutions. This is radical childcare done with Emmy Core and her team as part of Civic Square. 
And what you start to see is that this cascade of crises requires a cascade of solutions. How do we organize this in a democracy when it isn't about command and control? It isn't about the management of one single actor. How do we organize this becomes a real fundamental issue. And we need portfolios, portfolios of intervention, which together drive this reality. And yes, they can be on the treatment side. Yes, they can be on the biological conditions environment side. Yes, they also need to be a policy and regulation. So orchestration of change across the system requires a movement of interventions. How do we finance this movement is a real issue if we're going to talk about systems. And we have to recognize the problems themselves are deeply rooted in this reality. So poor housing results in social, uh, in healthcare costs. So how do we build the financial models to actually account for these spillover externalities? Whether it's housing and the healthcare system or it's housing and the penal system and actually our neighborhoods in the penal system. This is, this is a million dollar blocks work that happened in Chicago and other places. Again, you realize that actually the quality of our environment was generating huge liabilities and social costs for government as a result of actually the penal systems. The reality is, and this is something that social investment and the impact economy has ignored, is that social investment, societal investment always generates spillovers. And the reality is we've tried to build the impact economy based on one-to-one -one interventions. But actually, the truth is, it's a spillover. We have to redesign the impact economy for this scale. At the same time, for the systems effect, at the same time, we have to redesign it for the scale of the challenge we're talking about. When we know that the impact economy is going to be a function, if we're going to be relevant in terms of the transition, we're talking trillions of dollars, and not at the scale of ventures, and at the scale of social societal infrastructure. An example, I mean, this is just a very simple example of the spillover effect. The High Line in New York, again, this is some of the modeling that we've been, we've been doing, and what you start to realize is that the High Line in New York is a part of actually cost 178 million to build, but actually it would have paid for itself if you only put 10% of the land uplift value associated to the High Line, just 10%, and it would have paid for itself. So the High Line as a civic good was creating so much actual value for everyone else around it, yet the High Line physically itself was suffering. That is because we treated it as a discrete good as opposed to recognizing it's a societal good and how it operates. And again, there are new structures like smart covenants that we're exploring to be able to create these new class of system business models. And the same applies to trees. And why do I talk about trees? Well, the reality is places like Milan and Madrid are committing to planting millions of trees around, uh, around their cities, for, which will cost nearly 400 million plus in terms of euros to be able to drive. How do we do that? when a tree is actually a cost, a liability on a government. So we talk about the maintenance costs, which are the uh, maintenance costs, the direct costs, the administration, pruning, all the way through to actually the, the insurance costs of those trees. That's the real balance sheet impact. But if we want to understand it, we have to really understand the societal, uh, social, environmental, and other nonlinear benefits. And these are not immaterial. This is not a social ROI conversation. These are actually sitting on people's balance sheets, right? The kind of water retention issues or the worst, sustainable urban drainage means that rainwater companies or sewage companies don't have to build sewers. It reduces capex. So how do we contract this social value back into the system? How do we contract construct system business models is going to be critical for actually unlocking the 21st century impact economy. And that's vital. And a lot of the work that we're doing is being able to construct those system business models. And when we look at it, what becomes also clear is that, yes, we can talk about the externalities and the symptoms that we're trying to deal with. But what becomes clear is unless we address the accounting mechanisms, the how we account for these social goods, what our rules are, our budgeting mechanisms, even our thesis of rights and ownership, it's very difficult to deal with actually the challenges we're talking about, our budgeting, our style of budgeting between departments. So if we know that trees are going to impact the benefit of with mental health all the way through to actually sustainable urban drainage all the way through to co2 carbon sequestration rights these are multi multi uh, budget relationships unless we can start to build infrastructure which is about orchestrating this co-benefits economy we can't build the impact economy 
So the impact economy for me is about the system's view uh, fundamentally, but it does require us to reinvent bureaucracy, governance, financing, and the social norms. This is going to be the scale of the challenge for the 21st century impact economy. It will not be about ventures, social ventures and startups. It will be about systemic transformation of our of the transition capital needed for actually society. And that will impact natural assets economy. It will address all of those issues. So when we talk about this, let's recognize the financial gap. We're talking about billions, if not, uh, if not trillions, multi-trillions across the world. So if we're talking about this story, we have to recognize our impact economy currently is nowhere near the right size and scale to deal with the challenges that we talk about. And it will need to be of the right nature of financing. We will need it to be able to deliver nature-based solutions. The deep retrofit of our cities, which require 25 billion to retrofit a city, all the way through the reorchestration of our whole supply chains, all the way through to actually being able to value the health of a, of a city in terms of intangible outcomes all the way through to deep democracy. So we have to redesign our financing institutions for these new 21st century challenges. It needs to be focused on long financing, i.e. financing the 21st century, i.e. 100-year financing tools, imagined much more like infrastructure financing than anything else. And it needs a new governance accord. Public-private partnership mechanisms haven't really worked. And if we're going to create these long vehicles, we're going to have to reimagine governance fit for the 21st century, which doesn't create rent-seeking systems under the guise of social enterprise. So how do we do that is going to be really key. And we're going to have to engineer and understand the kind of externalities and future liabilities and be able to map them onto actually investment profiles. This is not about actually just saying, here's some social benefit. It is about being able to account for it and be able to link it in. When you're talking about billions of dollars, it won't work on that level. So at this time, we've seen massive proliferation of funds and fund capital supply. But actually what we need is a much more systemic solution to the impact economy. And this requires smart financial products linking the supply and demand of capital in new ways, data-driven, and actually creating a new flow of value. This is genuinely an impact economy. It won't be about, uh, about one aspect or another. When you look at this, you start to think about it in fundamentally different terms, all the way from the financial infrastructure, like the role of smart perpetual bonds, new, new smart community trust models, which are digital, open, radically transparent, all the way through to portfolio inf infrastructure models, which actually capture systems value. So I'm nearly coming to the end. And I suppose what I bring to this conversation is that when we look at this, what becomes clear is we're at the fundamental point where I think we're about to transform our relationships to the world. And this is just the beginning. Because actually, when we look at this at a structural level, I think when we talk about the impact economy of the 21st century, it is going to have to be able to invest in human development in a way that we've never been able to invest in before. Invest in human development for an age of discovery in an age of automation, age of care, creativity, craft. How do we invest in human development when even uh, humans on a corporation are effectively a liability and an overhead? How do we create the architecture to do that? How do we transform our relationship with nature so it's not one of financialization of nature, but one of cohabitation and investment for renewal of our nature-based assets and environments? How do we rebuild a new thesis of stewardship about uh, which goes beyond ownership? Because the reality is we cannot own the material world and hoard it and drive, just drive its hoarding. We will need a new relationship with stewardship and a new relationship with financing, which is or orchestrated and designed for long-termism, which isn't about colonizing that future. I think this transformation is at, at the center of its future. Our relationship with things, our relationship with being human, our relationship with nature, and our relationship with the future. And this will require us to address the deep lock-ins that we have uh, all the way through to actually our perceptions, our cultural perceptions with those assets and those relationships that we talk about, our relationship with nature, that being a resource, all the way through to the deep code errors, which are from accounting to budgeting mechanisms. This is a structural transformation if we're really going to build an economy and a society which is genuinely impactful and encouraging. I think we're better placed than we've ever been to make this transition. And I invite us to think about it through this way. Anything else is not really driving an impact economy. And that to me is both the opportunity that we sit in and the necessity of where we sit as well. So with that, I thank you. Thank you very much, Indy. Uh, we don't have much time. Just 
one question. Uh, which are the simple rules for you uh, to, for making these alliances work between the public and the private sector to, to arrive to this new uh, impact investing model? So what's clear to me is that the kind of firstly the thesis of public and private is problematic. In a systems entangled world, the idea that there is a such thing as private value and public value is problematic. I think we have to talk about entangled value. This is why more and more I talk about civic value. The question is, how do we create not rent-seeking systems? How do we create infrastructure which isn't based on rent-seeking? How do we drive trans radical transparency into our financial instruments? How do we actually appropriately uh, sort of appropriately price the cost of capital without it becoming a rent-seeking architecture? And that, I think, is a governance challenge. So I think more and more the way we're looking at it is is how do we construct new public trusts, smart public trusts, digital public trusts, which are radically transparent, which allow for private capital to be introduced, but actually that's dynamically priced and open and transparent in a way that actually the pricing of that capital can be easily interrogated and opened up. So I think the governance question has to be really radically reimagined, and that is a key component of opening up this, this economy. So um, in the, uh, what are the simple rules for making these alliances work between the private and public sector to make this impact investment? this new area work? Look, I, I think we have to firstly recognize the scale of the transition we're at. You know, impact investment and its thesis came out of commercial, commercial capital, commercial venture capital at best. We are talking about trillions of dollars are going to have to be deployed to actually de deal with the scale of the transition. We have not built the impact economy for the, that scale of capital. It's largely been a venture, a venture good story. So first thing is recognizing the scale of capital. Secondly, we have to recognize that for that scale of capital we've deployed, this is not about voluntary ethics. This is about a new framing and structuring and comprehension of value and liabilities in society. So it's about a new arch architecture of accounting and liabilities and externalities and remodeling that. And then actually thirdly, it's about recognizing that new classes of business models and value models are going to be constructed as a result of actually some of the kind of work we're doing around you know, contracting, micro-contracting of value, real-time adjustment, contingent models of contracting that allow us to be able to contract some of the spillover, both liabilities and also the positives in a new value model. So if a tree's value in terms of actually um, it's a tree's value in terms of sustainable urban drainage, in terms of heat island effects, in terms of carbon sequestration can be understood and computed, then you can start to contract that value back into the capital provision side. And then we have to construct new capital engines, which are not focused on five-year returns or six-year returns, but are actually looking at perpetual models of return, because effectively we have to destroy the capital asset appreciation risk in some of these civic goods. So there's a construction of a new economy and a new thesis, which starts from understanding the scale of the problem back down, as opposed to looking from the venture and the social social startup thesis. So I think this is a structural trans transformation. All right. Indy, thank you very much. It's been an honor to have you in our forum. Thank you. My absolute pleasure. Thank you for inviting me.